Go ahead. Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's my honor and privilege to introduce uh, Edmund uh, Villaroman to you. Uh, he's a very dear friend of mine. He is. Uh, he works in Manila, Philippines, in the Lung Cancer Center. He is now the chief of the place. Uh, an extremely, extremely busy surgeon, young, dynamic, upcoming on the Asian circuit. And he's now traveling to a lot of countries, uh, learning and teaching uh, the techniques of VATS. Uh, uh, just for the people who don't know, Philippines has got a similar demographics and geography to India and Southeast Asia. They do have a lot of uh, infective and inflammatory diseases. And Edmund particularly specializes now with uniportal VATS and does almost all his uh, surgeries by uniportal VATS. And he's going to share with us uh, his experience of inflammatory diseases, uh, role of VATS, and particularly role of uniportal VATS. Edmund, the floor is all yours. Uh, please share your screen and then take it away. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Khan. So, uh, good good evening here in the Philippines and uh, good day to uh, you. Um, so, I'll be discussing on uh, VATS for inflammatory conditions. It's uh, quite a broad topic. And uh, let me just start by, uh, yeah, uh, as mentioned, I was, I'm uh, affiliated with the Long Center of the Philippines, that's um, St. Luke's Medical Center. Um, St. Luke's is where we do our robotic surgery. Uh, but uh, we don't do robotic surgery for inflammatory, and like uh, Dr. Khan, who uh, will be publishing soon, uh, his uh, experience, a lot of experience with inflammatory conditions. So uh, we tend to do that through VATS. So this is our current. Um, uh, uh, Edmund, please yeah. share the desktop. We can't see your slides. Okay, yeah. Let me check. Um, And while Edmund's doing that, can I ask all the newcomers who are logging in to put your microphone mm -hmm. on mute? It's, it's very important that you put your microphone on mute so that we don't get disturbed by the sounds in your background. Yeah, so, Lord Deliz, Seniza, will you put your, will you please put your microphone on mute? Okay, I've done that for you. Okay, Edmund, we're waiting for your laptop. Any joy? Okay, is it working now? Uh, not yet. We oh. saw it earlier, so I'm just wondering why it's not coming on. Mm. Well, it did say that I'm supposed to be viewing your screen, but uh, I'm still seeing you. <laughs> okay, let me just... Uh... Okay, okay, hang on, hang on, Edwin. I'm, I've just changed it for you. Uh, yeah, we've got it. We got a lot. Got now. Yeah, go go into the go to your first slide, Edmund, and uh, go into the slide. Uh, go into the uh, screen mode. And 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 always remember that there is a slight gap between your slides changing. So there's a little delay. Mm -hmm. So try and talk slowly so that. We, we stick to your slides. Sometimes uh, you might be talking and the slide might not have changed. So just give yourself that little hesitation. Back to your first slide, please. Okay, you see it now? We see it now, we're, we're winning. Thank you, carry on. Oh, that's great, that's great. Okay, so. Uh... Okay, so. Here, just, just to show you uh, what uh, we have in the Philippines right now. Um, yeah, we are a population of 103 million. And uh, the, the leading cause of uh, morbidity and mortality is a combined, uh, you know, TB, pneumonia, COPD, and lung cancer is the, the most, uh, you know, killer disease in the Philippines, more than heart disease. And uh, we do have, we do encounter a lot of TB and, um, you know, complications with pneumonia. 
uh, in our society of uh, thoracic surgeons, there are about uh, 160 members, and about one third of those are, are thoracic surgeons, which are distributed in different areas of the Philippines, uh, mostly on metropolitan areas. And we do have a, a lack of uh, manpower with regards uh, management of, of thoracic disease. So lung resection in the Philippines, uh, 40 to 50 percent of the cases we do are due to infectious inflammatory conditions, particularly TB, bronchiectasis, pergillomas, lung abscesses, uh, MDR and XDR TBs. And a lot of these patients present with uh, massive hemoptysis and uh, they have a uh, very poor nutritional status. The majority of lung cancers are um, locally advanced and about only 10% are candidates for surgery, uh, most of them developing because of scar carcinoma. Um, our status about nationwide 40% of lung resections are done through VATS and at the Lung Center of the Philippines about 80-90% are performed through um, VATS, usually through uniportal VATS. So this is our, our um, um, recent uh, data on vasobectomy at the Lung Center. So from, uh, for the past uh, three years, uh, we have done a lot of, uh, about 46% of the cases we do are inflammatory. And uh, about 50% uh, of those are because of malignancy. And our conversion rates to open are about 12%. And majority is because of non-progression, because of you know, very, very dense adhesions. So uh, my topic will be infectious inflammatory lung disease that it covers uh, plural infection. Uh, I'll be covering a bit about that and, uh, and uh, plural, uh, I mean uh, lung infections uh, uh, and performing uh, minimally invasive procedures for uh, those uh, conditions. So for empyema thoracis, uh, we have this stages of empyema thoracis. Uh, we all know this uh, stage one is exudative, Two is about uh, fibrinopurulent, uh, three is organized. And um, if you read on the books, there, you know, there's sort of an evolution for the development of uh, this uh, in between the stages. Um, for exudative, it's like zero to two weeks, and fibrinopurulent is about uh, one to six weeks, and the third stage, the organized phase, is about five weeks. But we do encounter in practice, you know, we have had uh, immunocompromised patients that uh, even after about uh, a week or so of uh, uh, infectious manifestations of a developing fever and cough, they do develop empyema. So there's not really a, a clear cut, uh, you know, duration for each stage. And some develop quite fast. So it's important for us to have this uh, know this stage of uh, development of empyema management in each. So there's a difference also with you know the characteristic of the fluid for stage one, two, and three, and of course also for imaging uh, with regards X-ray and CT scan for uh, 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 different stages. So the primary goal, uh, based on the AATS consensus guidelines, management of management of empyema is uh, one is complete evacuation actually infected fluid um, and two is complete expansion of the lung so there are so many you know, ways of managing um, empyema thoracis from putting in you know, chest tubes and open tubes creating plural, plural windows others would do vats uh, others would instill fibrinolytics and others you know for more advanced uh, stages organized uh, phase like thoracoplasties, muscle plumbage. So it's, it's a bit confusing. So this, um, um, this diagram basically shows the different stages. And as I mentioned, in those stages, there are a lot of overlaps and there is no clear um, specific uh, time period for each. So for if you, have, you, can't, you get the patients on exudative phase on the stage one, so it, it's important to do drainage uh, other than um, your IV antibiotics. Um, for stage two, you can do VATS in evacuation. Um, others would recommend fibrinolysis, but the data on fibrinolysis for empyema are usually for those areas without a thoracic surgeon, wherein there is no access for a thoracic surgeon. And they, you know, uh, some pulmonologists would offer like putting in chest tubes or plural drains and putting in fibrinolytics, but it's not really equivalent 
to the outcomes that we have, uh, you know, draining it through visio assisted thoracic surgery. And for more organized phase, then you have options for doing, you know, decortication through, through open or VATS and, uh, you know, for more uh, advanced uh, stages, um, uh, thoracoplasties. So the recommendations for um, uh, empyema thoracis uh, for stage one is uh, image-guided pleural drain placement. Uh, it's useful in the early treatment. Um, this is uh, for, for uh, Thoracostomy should be combined with the CT follow-up after uh, putting in a drain to confirm the adequacy of drainage. And, um, you know, if there's any persistence of any fluid or more aggressive uh, management. So VATS should be the first line of approach in all patients with stage 2 acute empyema. Okay. So this is basically the, the recommendation based on the AATS uh, for stage 2 or three empyema requiring surgical intervention. So that's uh, to achieve full expansion um, of the lung and for the full evacuation. Um, okay, this is a, an example of a case. Uh, this is a stage uh, two empyema. Um, so you can see there are a lot of material. We see this very often in, in, in practice. So it's a good way to start uh, minimally invasive uh, thoracic surgery um, just by uh, evacuating this, uh, this empyema. So you can get a feel in the hand imagination. So everyone starts with you know, pleural infection and drainage uh, resistance. So uh, you know, complete evacuation of the infected material and uh, expansion of the lung. So this was a, uh, a post-infectious uh, uh, empyema thoracis. So um, in this, in some cases, they do. Uh, develop this thick peel that covers the lung, prevents it from expanding, causing a trapped lung. So you do uh, decortication to try to free up and uh, let that lung expand. So this is a more advanced stage, maybe a stage uh, two to three uh, empyema thoracis. Okay, so let, let's proceed now to uh, lung infections. So when we talk about lung infections, it's important for us to, uh, of course, discuss um, tuberculosis, which is the uh, number one killer, um, top infectious disease killer in the world. Uh, just uh, in 2017, about 1.6 million people died from TB. And... Uh, about 10 million people fell ill because of, of, of this uh, disease. This is based on the uh, Global Tuberculosis Report of 2018. So these are the high burden countries, um, including India, um, Indonesia, China, um, in the Philippines. Um, we about in, in 2017, we have uh, about almost 600,000 people who fell ill of TB just in one year and about 27,000 TB deaths. So these are the other countries uh, with high burden, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Thailand. So there's this uh, move by the World Health Organ Organization to end the TB. And the objective is uh, to reduce uh, TB deaths by 90%. Uh, there's an 80% reduction of TB incidence rate by 20, uh, 2030. Um, but if you look at the, you know, the actual graph, what actually happens, it's not actually a single graph, but rather made up of three graphs. So with a global TB trend of uh, decreasing 1.6% per year, but 
is actually made up of three other graphs. Uh, this, that, that is uh, basically made up of drug resistant TB, uh, which is going down. But we have MDR and XDR TB, which is going up about 10% per year. So if we follow on this graph, you know, by, by about 20, 2035, you'll have probably more multi drug resistant TB and XDR TB than drug resistant TB. This is a big problem. So surgery is very important as an adjunct to medical management of uh, TB. Um, it is an option for drug susceptible TB and um, multi-drug resistant or ex extremely drug resistant TB, um, which is localized. And uh, it's important to have four to six months of supervised anti-TB chemotherapy combined with pulmonary resection. So the success rate increases to about 88 to 92%. So it's important if we consider surgery for TB that you should have adequate anti-TB treatment uh, that has failed to cure the patient, so failure of medical management, but the disease should be sufficiently localized maybe to just one lobe or one lung, and there's, there should be a sufficient pulmonary reserve and um, a good surgical risks. So the contraindications exist uh, for lung resection, um, then you know, collapse uh, therapy like thoracoplasties can be used. So what about our, our topic is VATS for lung resection for inflammatory disease. How is it different from VATS for uh, neoplastic disease? Well, just to show you, uh, this is a, a, a patient, 27-year-old female with a multi-drug resistant TB. Um, she underwent second line anti TB treatment for eight months, but uh, you know the sputum and smear, uh, sputum smear and cultures were still positive, and uh, this patient was suspected to have an extremely drug resistant TB, and she presented with massive hemoptysis. You can see uh, on the on the PET scan that uh, severely destroyed um, upper and uh, middle lobe, and uh, left left uh, lung is already hyper rated. So th there's likewise a uh, fungus, a fungus ball, a spurgeloma on the right upper lobe. So this is a typical patient that uh, uh, we do. You can see the very, very dense adhesions, uh, especially at the apex and at the base. Um, it's, it's not really a good um, video to, to demonstrate um, you know, the anatomy of the lung because a lot of these are additions and uh, about uh, two thirds of the time, operative time is dedicated to just doing adhesion lysis because uh, you, 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 could, you couldn't see the hilum uh, until you have, you know, clearly dissected all those adhesions. So you can see there the fissures are, you're completely fused. Um, very, very dense adhesions, and the lung is likewise, the, the chest wall is likewise contracted. Are you doing this uniportal or three ports? Well, uh, we do add ports. Uh, um, if, if there's difficulty accessing, you know, the dense adhesions, we don't stick to just doing uniports. So if there's a need for additional ports, we we'll make it a two port if needed, an uh, additional port, like a three port incision. But we usually do start with the uh, uniport uh, approach. Okay. So, um, lung resection for inflammatory disease, the technical concerns are as follows. One is you have a small contracted pleural cavity with a narrow intercostal space. So, just entering the chest uh, is, is really a great difficulty. If you have a dense adhesion along that um, access port that we do for uniportal, uh, that, that's already a, a difficult thing. So you have to correlate with your with the X-ray and CT scan whether you have uh, adhesions in that area. So another is you have a lung that's consolidated and in, it does not com uh, deflate completely. So even if you're, you have a very good uh, thoracic anesthesiologist uh, who does a good lung isolation, you know, there's always a difficulty for that lung to, to collapse because it's consolidated because of, you know, the, the, the infection. Um, in, in that lung. 
Another is you have a thickened hilar in mediastinal pleura. So it's not like in, in lung cancer that you know you can easily dissect with, with uh, blunt and, and sharply section your, your pleura. These are very, very dense adhesions. Another is the distorted hilar anatomy due to volume loss. So I've had a patient that, you know, because of the dense, dense adhesions, uh, you know, the, the hilum was, was pulled uh, away from the usual location. And it, it, one of, um, uh, we did a case that we thought, uh, you know, one of the, the vessels was high up in the hilum. We thought it was a part of the pulmonary vein. When, then we realized it was actually um, the, the SVC was severely contracted. So we had to repair the SVC after we realized uh, that it was the SVC. So we used uh, the um, azigus vein as a graft to patch up that, uh, that SVC. Blimey. That's so, yeah, this is, this is a difficult case. Uh, so another problem is uh, enlarged, inflamed, and matted lymphadenopathies. Um, that you don't see the hilum. So you have to dig in and take in all those uh, lymph nodes before you can actually access the hilum, the vessels. Another is a failure of the remaining ipsilateral lung to expand fully. This is post-op. And after doing usually an upper lobectomy, your, 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 your uh, remaining lung doesn't really expand fully. So you, you have that space problem uh, post-op. And we see that a lot for uh, spurgillomas, complex spurgillomas. And another is airway concerns due to massive hemoptysis. So a lot of the patients come in with massive hemoptysis, so we have to control them first. Uh, we usually put in an endobronchial blocker uh, to block it and then uh, you know, try to, to, to temporize and uh, do the surgery um, two or three days after uh, we have controlled that uh, hemoptysis. Another is the very dense vascular pleural adhesions and obliterated pleural space. Uh, like the ones you, I showed earlier in that video. Um, and the absence of fissures. You, you have grade four fissures, very, very thick fissures. That is very difficult to manage because some, even the thickest staplers, if you use them, um, sometimes doesn't close. And uh, lastly, you have an inflamed uh, bronchus, uh, which you know, could, could uh, result in uh, development of bronchopleural pistolas. Uh, post op. So, all of these uh, last few concerns we have and lead to air leaks, um, persistent air leaks, and bronchopleural fistulas is one of the problems uh, that we encounter post op. Uh, this is an example of uh, infectious uh, uh, lung disease. This was a, uh, a bronchectasis with a spurgiloma. You know, just entry, you could see there, have that uh, uh, wound retractor, wound protector. I just enter the chest and you see you can counter already the dense uh, adhesions. Um, you know, doing this adhesion lysis uh, can result in a lot of alveolar leaks. You can see there, uh, this, this case was quite different because uh, this, this patient, other than having a bronchitis and a spurgiloma, had uh, a pulmonary AV malformation. And because of the pulmonary AV malformations, the, um, you know, the, the vascular uh, adhesions in the chest wall also developed. And um, these were very huge uh, uh, collaterals from the chest wall. <coughs> and uh, <clears throat> another is development of uh, alveolar air leaks um, for, for the divorce's problem is uh, is to detect closer to the lung that you are about to resect and to we usually combine uh, monopolar for hard to reach um, areas which is difficult to if you use an advanced bipolar ultrasonic for dense adhesions um, along the, the the chest wall the lateral chest wall it's it's virtually impossible even if you do a, a multi-port uh, vats to reach those areas so we usually release that using monopolar um, electrocautery, and we combine it with uh, advanced bipolar or ultrasonic, which uh, you know is a combination of compression and heat, uh, which provides better hemostasis and hemostasis compared to a monopolar. So this is an example of that uh, dense uh, adhesions. 
I remember Dr. Khan, when you went to the lung center, we, we did one case um, of uh, spurgiloma. Yeah, that's right. I yeah. The airport, so I don't know what happened afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I continued the operation, the patient did well. Yeah. <laughs> so the recommendation is, uh, you know, some would say, you know, if, if those not really um, doing a lot of inflammatory, they say you should do extrapural dissection. Um, I really do not recommend that because if you do extrapural dissection in all, especially the thick adhesions in the apex, um, you know, you're going to have a lot of bleeding along the chest wall. It's just very difficult to control. So in those cases, we use... We've lost your volume, Edmund. We've lost your sound. Yeah, okay, we're back. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. I'm back up? Yes, you are. Okay. Okay, so we try to minimize blunt dissection, especially for those dense vascular adhesions to minimize bleeding and ear leaks. So another problem is that thick absent grade four fissure. Um, so again, this is an example of that case. You don't see a fissure. This is, a, this is an upper lobe um, and you don't see a fissure there. So um, we usually um, do the tunneling technique and we use the hyalur vessels as uh, landmarks, particularly the, the veins, the hyalur veins to uh, delineate uh, where the fissure is. And we use the, the thickest stapler, stapler available uh, to staple this uh, very thick fissures. Sorry, the slides um, hanging. Okay, so if, if you're not yet still familiar, there's actually um, you know anatomical classification um, of pulmonary fissures that was uh, proposed by uh, William Walker uh, from Edinburgh, and uh, he proposed a grade one fissure that the PA is readily uh, visualized, like this uh, this video. You could clearly see that uh, interlobar PA along the fissure. Uh, and grade two is uh, revealed following minimal dissection. So after doing some sharp and blunt dissection, you see that PA, that's a grade two. And for a grade three, there's only this uh, shallow cleft uh, and you need a lot of dissection um, to, to identify that PA. And finally, a grade four fissure, there is no discernible fissure, fissural cleft at all on uh, initial inspection. And uh, in inflammatory conditions, uh, mostly these are grade uh, three and grade four uh, fissures that we see. So for uh, grade four fissures, a recommendation is you do a fissure last or the fissure less uh, technique which minimizes uh, parenchymal injury and uh, ear leaks, uh, specifically for grade three and grade four fissures. So if you do a, you know, the, if you're used to doing a, a fissure first or fissure based technique, then you should do a tunneling technique, again, uh, identifying the vessels in the hilum, particularly the pulmonary vein, which guides uh, you in where that, uh, where the, that fissure ends. So this is an example of that video of a Fisher uh, last technique. So after you have taken out, this is an upper lobe, after you've, you've taken out the, uh, the uh, pulmonary artery branches to the upper lobe, the pulmonary vein, uh, and, and the bronchus, and then you do it last. And uh, you just, uh, it's quite easy to, to perform because uh, the lung is, is uh, already deflated. You can see there that uh, fissure. Uh, this is the minor fissure that, that uh, is being stapled. You try to thin it out as much as you can. 
again, if you use very, uh, you use a green or a, a minimum of green or a, a black staper for this, uh, ideally. Okay, so uh, again, use uh, an endostaper for um, for thick fissures uh, with a 4.1 open staple height or thicker. And um, there are different brands of staplers that we've been using. Um, you know, you, sh you should use a minimum of a green for very thick fissures. Uh, ideally, use a purple or, or a black for that. Um, others would put uh, staple line reinforced reinforcements like uh, you know buttresses so gore has his uh, brand the seam guard and uh, medtronic has a uh, reinforced uh, reload um, that you don't have to you know the the, the gore seam guard is like um, you know like a sock you put inside a staple and uh, medtronic has this uh, reinforced one you don't have to put put in the sock others would put in uh, surgical sealants like you know cyanoacrylate or fibrin glue to minimize air leaks. So another concern again is uh, an inflamed bronchus. Um, yeah, this is an example of that uh, very thick, uh, very inflamed uh, bronchus. Uh, this can be actually avoided if you do proper um, treatment, medical treatment, especially for TB. So, so I rec recommend giving um, uh, anti-TB medications for, if, if possible, a minimum of four months uh, before you do surgery to minimize this problem of having a bronchial stump uh, blowout. So you can see there are very inflamed um, uh, upper lobe bronchus. So uh, what we do is, uh, we do a preoperative bronchoscopy and in patients uh, and rule out the possibility of endobronchial TB. And again, start these patients on anti-TB medications for a minimum of four months prior to lung resection and do nutritional buildup. But uh, most of the cases we get because they present with uh, hemoptysis, uh, massive hemoptysis. So there's, um, you know, you can't get that um, ideal four months of treatment. And a lot of these patients just undergo about two weeks of treatment. Um, and you have to go in to control the, the hemoptysis. So in some cases, even if they, they ha didn't have any treatment, uh, we do surgery for them, uh, especially for those uh, with uh, exaggerating um, hemoptysis. Before, we were doing a lot of prone thoracotomies. Uh, before, uh, uh, we were, there, there, was, there weren't any um, double lumen tubes. Now, the recommendation, again, is to transect, uh, bronchial transection should be done at the origin of the bronchus. It, try to, to minimize having that long stump. Uh, use thick endostapers and, uh, again, uh, reinforce uh, the, the staple lines. So for uh, using, you can use uh, viable tissues like the intercostal muscle or the decimus but you have to harvest it uh, before resection. Okay, so uh, this is an example of a case that um, had a stump blowout. This is a uh, uh, right upper lobectomy, and you can see there that the there's a huge defect and opening there in the right upper lobe. Um, you know, in a recommendation, if you have that, if you detect it early, uh, you do primary repair of the fistula and reinforce it with, with uh, viable tissue, buttress it. Uh, but if you de detect it late and the patient develops empyema, then you do drainage, pleural drainage, IV antibiotics, and optimization of the nutrition. For chronic empyema, <clears throat> you, could, you should... Um, you should uh, make a pleural window uh, for adequate drainage, uh, followed by either you know muscle plumbage or thoracoplasty. Um, others are recommend, rec recommending endoscopic option of putting in endobronchial one-way valves to close it, but you know there's uh, 
uh, minimal experience uh, using this for specifically for stone blowouts. So this is an example of a case I did a 54 year old female who had completed treatment for TB uh, for six months, had recurrent massive hemoptysis, about 350 cc. Um, and the uh, CT scan showed in spurgioloma, the apical segment of the left of the lobe. So I did a single port uh, VATS um, left upper lobectomy. Again, this is the, the x-ray. You can see there's a severely contracted left upper lobe. Um, you know, this is a very typical um, uh, spurgioloma with the monad sign, inverted um, uh, crescent sign. And this patient presented with hemoptysis, so we had to place in uh, a Fogarty and, and the bronchial catheter. We localized the bleeding to the uh, left upper lobe and placed that um, Fogarty catheter, then worked up the patient, and three days after, he underwent uh, uteroportal vats. So you can see there that the very dense adhesions in the apex. So we tend to try to do adhesiolysis first uh, along the apex, then we sort of go around the, the my technique for doing a tissue lysis is i don't i don't just do a frontal attack i tend to um attack uh from both sides and flank that uh, um apex so you can see clearly you can see the the the, the area that uh, you need to take care of and and uh, be wary of uh, like um Specifically, if you have uh, adhesions close to the to the hilum, so you can see here um, after dissecting the posterior went in front and uh, did the tissue lysis. This is now dissecting the uh, anterior anterior hilum. So I usually use uh, a combination of uh, sharp and uh, blunt dissection. So this is now, you can clearly see now the, the PA. Um, that's the left main PA over there. And the uh, uh, V1, uh, 2, and 3, which are branches of the superior pulmonary vein. So first I staple that uh, branch of V1. So then I isolated and stapled the anterior branch, the A3 of the pulmonary artery. Then took out uh, B1 plus 2 of the superior pulmonary vein. So you can see, you see there the A1 plus 2, um, apical posterior, going to the apical posterior segment. Then I go um, along the fissure and, and did uh, the section along the fissure. So I stapled that uh, incomplete, incomplete fissure. So you could clearly see there now how the branch the pulmonary artery. This is uh, isolation stapling of the lingular branches, the A4 and then A5. And this is the left upper lobe now using a, a green uh, stapler. So you can see I am, I'm using a different brands. Uh, I usually don't stick to one. Use both uh, Medtronic and J&J. &J. Whatever's available. Okay. So, um, the main goal of surgery is to remove the heavy bacterial load. Um, lung resection, remember, is an adjunct to medical management. So at least now it's not three months, but four months of medical treatment followed by lung resection, followed by 18 to 24 months of medical treatment. This is for uh, surgery for multi-drug resistant or extremely drug resistant TB using second line uh, anti-TB medications. And the role of surgery for MDR, the rationale again is uh, you know, the cavities harbor that resistant organism and, you know, drugs, the, the 
anti-TB drugs does not penetrate the cavities well. Therefore, resection of these cavities improves the chance for cure. So a uh, destroyed lung or lobe acts in a similar way in a, uh, uh, to a cavitary disease. So um, the patient selection for uh, surgery for MDR, um, you do this for those with drug resistance with a high probability of failure or relapse. You have, should have a localized disease and you should, should have a, a available adequate anti-TB drugs, second line anti-TB drugs, at least uh, two effective drugs. Um, for you not to have, you know, the problems of uh, bronchial stump blowout, and you should have adequate cardiopulmonary reserve. So having a negative culture or smear is not a prerequisite for surgery, but it would would, would be good if if you can do it on an elective basis. Again, have four months of treatment, but uh, in patients with MDR, it's not really feasible for you to have those negative uh, cultures most of the time. So at least four months of anti-TB treatment is recommended prior to uh, surgery. So I think that's my uh, last slide, uh, Dr. Khan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Edmund, for a really uh, exhaustive uh, coverage of TB and the problems of TB. Now I'm gonna take this opportunity to ask a few questions uh, on behalf of the students uh, so that we we get uh, some sort of a clarity of picture. Is that okay with you? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. So I'll 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 get online now. First thing first. Can you stop sharing your desktop? Mm -hmm. So just go and stop sharing. So we'll have you on the video, and then we can talk about it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Sorry, just one second. I, I'm so sorry about this. Just one second, please. I'm so sorry about that. It's just my daughter is locked out of the house. <laughs> you should open it. Yeah, I know. I have to open the door for her. As you Definitely. Do. You know how. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, Let's start off first with the, you did say something about adequate anti-tuberculous therapy. Uh, have you got any yeah. idea of what sort of uh, anti-tuberculous therapy you need to give for a minimum of four to six weeks? Can you just highlight that for the students? Well, we usually give a four drug regimen uh, for, for um, TB. This is uh, for drug resistant TB. Yeah, yeah, sure. So you give rifampicin, isoniazid, uh, ethambutol, and pyrazinamide. You give it for uh, the quadruple treatment for about uh, two to three months, and the remaining for the next uh, up to about six months, you do a three drug uh, regimen. And this is ideal. Um, you're doing an elect case for me. But for cases with massive hemoptysis, you just give uh, you know two weeks of treatment and try to delay it if, if possible. But then again, if these patients are presenting with, with massive hemoptysis, it's not necessary for you to um, convert uh, the smears into negative before you do surgery. Uh, it really depends upon your indication. So if you're doing this for like maybe a, you know just um, recurrent and massive hemoptysis that you can actually delay the surgery until you have uh, better uh, coverage of uh, anti-TB um, anti treatment, then you know that would be good. But if again, presenting with massive hemoptysis, like the cases that we have, we just have, really, have to do. Yeah, you have to do yeah. uh, what you need to do. And it's, it's just a way of control. Minimum is six feet. What I want you to emphasize for the students is the WHO strategy for uh, eradicating TB, or actually it's not eradicating, it's control of tuberculosis. I, I, I think these slides, uh, I want all the students to go back to the slides and definitely look up the one where he's talking about the WHO strategy, because 2030 is, is, the, is the key thing. And 2035, that is 2035, is the year when the WHO wants to erad eradicate TB. But one important point that he made is that 
that's just one graph, but actually there are three graphs on top of it. Can you just go back to the slide and just explain the three graphs that is yes, yes, yes. quite important for the students. You will be asked in the exam, what is the WHO strategy for TB control? And what are the, what are the milestones? You've got to know 2035. You've got to know 2030 and 2035. We're just going to show you again. This is a very important document and anybody going for an exam must read this document. So I just, I'm going to request him. Yeah, just show us the page with the document on it. Yeah. The yes. can, you, can you see that? Very good. Uh, yeah, can, yeah, okay. Again, the, the, the objective uh, is uh, by 2030, you know, the reduction in 90% reduction in death, 80% reduction in TB incidence and they would want to eradicate TB by about 2035. And that is the, if, if, if uh, we could continue with that trend of uh, decreasing uh, uh, TB by about 1.5% uh, per year. This okay. is very important. These figures that he's quoting are very important, particularly guys who are going for the FRCS or the MCH exam, because your FRCS exam is in Malaysia. Malaysia also has a lot of tuberculosis. And you are highly likely to have a long case as a TB. And if the discussion goes on to the management of TB, you must throw in this WHO statement, okay, the NTB strategy. And so please uh, uh, just go a slide forward, uh, Edmund. You, you all, yeah, this is it. This is the slide. You really need to know this slide. So for everybody, if you've got your uh, camera somewhere, just take a picture of it or Later on, go back online and take a snapshot. This document is freely available on the WHO website. The only problem is you yeah. don't know about it, so you're not looking at it. So this is a very important document. And you yeah. must throw in 2030 and 2035. These two deadline milestones are important. And the other important milestone is an 80% reduction and a 90% reduction. But the important thing that he has told you is about three graphs, one on top of the other. So the increase, the 10% increase incidence of MDR-TB and the 10.5% increase in incidence of XDR-TB. This is very important. Okay. Now, just yeah. coming back to uh, your talk on the surgical management, I think there was a beautiful uh, slide on the WHO indications for surgery in tuberculosis. If you could go back to that slide, you very clearly mm -hmm. the document and there were four indications, three or four indications. Yes. So this is very important again, uh, just go into the slideshow. And I want everybody to take a snapshot of this slide because you will be asked in the exam, either on your Viva table or on the long, tab uh, on the long case, what is the role of surgery in the treatment of pulmonary TB? And this is the document you have to quote. You cannot just say, you know, this is it, that it's according to the WHO uh, document 2014, these are the indications. He's beautifully marked it out, one, two, three, and four. And more importantly, the contraindication for surgery in tuberculosis. Agreed, Edmund? Yes, yes. There's still a role for collapse. Um... Uh, therapy uh, those who tolerate resection uh, this is still being performed uh, but these are being performed uh, lesser and lesser uh, because of you know newer drugs that we're having for um, um, TB treatment the second line drugs that we've, we've, been, we've been having yeah so I, I'm now going to come on to the surgical management rather than uh, talk about medical management what in your practice is Contraindications to VATS. I'm talking about mm -hmm. three unibody, it doesn't matter. Just tell me what are the contraindications. What patients will you A, not do VATS or convert to open thoracotomy? Yes. Uh, we're, we're actually, uh, for the past several years, uh, we have been uh, trying to go. Edmund, stop sharing your slides and come, come on live on the screen. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, we lost your volume, Edmund. Remember, contraindications. 
Okay. Um, You're on. Okay, that's good. Okay, again, for the before I inflations, because of you know a density, one of the I think we have lost Edmund uh, the volume. Edmund, we keep losing your volume. Can we repeat what you just said? Yeah. So um, we try to extend you know the indications for that's for what we do. Okay, this but we first do VATS where in in doing a digitalize yeah. Edmund, can you just move closer to your Wi-Fi this thing because we're losing your volume all the time uh, if if you can just come a bit closer to your Wi-Fi uh, modem but just just for the while you're doing that just for the trainees I'll I'll just highlight some contraindications can you guys hear me are we okay can somebody just show me a thumbs up Okay, good. So the contraindications for VATS are first, it begins with inability to isolate the other lung. Okay, and that could be either because the, the correct size tube is not available or because the patient is too obese or the anesthetist is not experienced. Okay, so that's the first contra. Edmund, we got you back. So do you want to talk about okay, this contraindications for VATS? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, one of we, we, we've tried for the past five years and, and tried to apply VATS for all cases of uh, inflammatory conditions, whether you have like this, uh, you know, contracted chest wall or very dense adhesions. And we, we tried to see how far we can go with VATS. And we have had conversions uh, because, you know, because of non-progression, because, you know, because of the very dense adhesions we had to convert. And a lot of these conversions were, were because of that uh, non-progression, not really because of bleeding. We did have a, um, you know, a few bleedings that we had to convert. But uh, one thing that we found out is like, uh, we do have a lot of conversions if you have a very dense contracted uh, chest wall that you have you know, very little space for you to work on. And you have to do, you know, because of the narrow interspace, you have to do, um, rib resection for you to go in so one, those are the cases that we we found we found that we need to do this cases and open thoracotomies instead uh other than what you have mentioned like you know failure of uh, lung isolation uh you know some technical concerns like failure of your 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 equipments uh, during surgery that you need to convert but very there's there's a few cases that we actually need open surgery now and we have we have extended with 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 better experience we have had um done a lot of cases that normally uh could not be done with with video assisted yeah, yeah sure i'm just going to sort of highlight a few points because these guys are going to be asked this question in the exam and they must have one two three four answer so let, let me just the first point is inability to isolate the other lung which could be either because of a very obese patient, which could be because the correct size tube is not available, or it could be an inexperienced anesthetist. So these are the three, four points. That's that first one, inability to isolate the other lung. The other point he's very clearly made is dense adhesions or a contracted chest. So in an exam, you're supposed to say this. If it's a contracted chest, with very tight space and you cannot enter it, you would rather do it as open. Dense adhesions is a contraindication, but in experienced hands, it's not. But in a general scenario, as a student, I would expect you to say that dense adhesions, I would convert to open. And one more important, uh, of course, another point is bleeding. Bleeding is not a good idea if you're not experienced and with bleeding, it's better to convert and save the patient's life. And the last but most important point is abnormal anatomy. So inability to isolate the lung, inability to enter into the chest because of a contracted chest, 
dense adhesions, severe bleeding, or most importantly, abnormal anatomy. When you don't know what is the structure that you're dealing in front of you, that's a contraindication. You must open the chest. I mean, Edmund and I, we, we are at a different level of exp experience, but you must in the exam say these four points and say, I will convert to open. And you must in fact throw in the word that conversion is not a failure of wax. We actually sure. want to save the patient's life. A live patient into theater should be equal to a live patient out of theater. It doesn't matter what technique you use. Okay, so as an example, particularly the FRCS guys, because you're supposed to be a day one consultant the next day, we are testing your uh, ability to do something safely. Do no harm is the, is the philosophy. And so you must be able to, in the viva or in the clinical case, clearly justify how you would follow do no harm, okay? Or you could also say, I will call an experienced surgeon or a senior surgeon. That's also a very much accepted answer that I would call an experienced surgeon if he's available to help me if I'm in trouble. So in an FRCS exam, please remember all these words. Now, uh, Edmund, because you do a lot of uniportal, we will step away from inflammatory diseases. I'm gonna take this mm -hmm. opportunity to sort of highlight some things for the students. So what, according to you, are indications for uniportal facts? We're talking about all thoracic surgery. And this is again for the exam going student. If he's ever asked uniportal VATS, what would you suggest them to talk about? Yeah, um, well, uniportal VATS is just, um, you know, one way of approaching, uh, you know, one of the evolutions of, of VATS. And uh, you, you have to understand, you know, the evolution from thoracotomy to VATS to uniportal, even now doing uh, sub, sub siphoid. VATS approach, these are different approaches of, of doing a lobectomy, even robotic approach. But um, what's important is that you try to do uh, minimally invasive and try to shy away from doing uh, thoracotomy if needed, especially for those uh, you know, early lung cancer cases. And uh, um, you know, portal is a, a like um, in the evolution, um, I personally started with, with multi-port VATS and eventually decreased my number, the number of ports. It's not really necessary for everyone to do Uniportal. If you have and, and, and you're doing well with the, the, the technique you're using with the Uniport, maybe a three-port, a two-port, then you, you could, you could uh, just stay with, there's, there's actually no difference. Okay. There are studies already that came out yeah. That, uh, yeah. you know, doing single port versus a three port or two port really doesn't change anything. Um, what, yeah. what, is so that, this is what is that study, Edwin? Can you tell these guys what is the study so that they can have it in their evidence-based medicine? Where did well, it... if, if you may, I can show you that um, um, a, 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 a presentation I made uh, on, uh, I'll share this uh, slide. Let me just uh, pull this one up. So, so what, according to the current literature, is mm -hmm. the advantage of uniportal? Is there any advantage or there is no advantage currently? According to literature, we're not talking about Diego or your view or my view. We're talking about literature. Yes, yes, yes. I have to justify that. Well, there's, a, there's a study published by um, Alan uh, recently. And, um, you know, uh, this study showed that um, uniportal vas actually at, at present time does not really uh, show a clear advantage over uh, Unipodal. Okay. Uh, with regards to uh, doing a uh, You made a very important statement, Edmund. Uh, I mean, I, I really mm -hmm. appreciate that. It is for these mm -hmm. examining students. I want them to understand that at the moment, we do not have evidence to suggest that Unipodal is any better than three ports. It does yes, not, it's true. It does not do Unipodal. It just, if somebody asks you in an exam, what is the evidence for practicing uniportal? You have to be honest enough to say that at this moment, we do not have the evidence. It is a new technique, which is fairly recent and in its infancy, and there is not enough long-term data to tell us 
that uniportal is beneficial over two ports or whether two ports is beneficial over three ports. So you in the exam should not say, I will do a uniport vaclobectomy because A, you are not experienced, B, you wouldn't have done enough work and it would be a disaster if the examiner is an old timer who completely hates uniportal. So do not <laughs> jump into that scenario. You, you can get into trouble with this. Just because you have uh, got a consultant who does uniportal, you should not say that. You should say, according to evidence, I think there is no real advantage of uniportal over multiportal, according to the current evidence. In future, we will have more evidence which will show mm -hmm. that it is beneficial. And also the second reason why you would do uniportal is to learn the ability to operate through a single port because robotics is going single port. And that's sure. the real future of uniportal. You know, if you know how to operate in a straight line rather than a triangulation, then when the robotic single port comes in, you are way ahead of the game. So when you answer in a FRCS examination, it should be a balanced answer. You should not go one way or the other. So you should try and balance your thing out and you should say, you should not say it is a bad technique. You should say the evidence at the moment is not available and actually uniportal, learning to do uniportal may make me, it may put me in a better position to actually adopt the single port robotic surgery. This is the answer I expect to hear from you. So you know that there is a new future development of a single port robot. That's what it tells me that you've been reading the current literature and you're up to date with the most recent. Now, Edmund is just showing you these slides. Just have a quick look. Yeah. Just, just to show you that, that evolution, how we yes, went so. from thoracotomy to VATS. And, you know, uh, basically we were doing before, uh, you know, a posterior lateral thoracotomy that yes, eventually evolved. Slide. We can't see that. Play the yeah. Slide. yeah. So those that went into, stood in front of the patients doing axillary and lateral thoracotomy eventually went into anterior approach. And the VATS anterior approach developed into, you know, different ways of doing it. Using multi-port VAT, two-port, uniport, sub -siphoid. these are all anterior approach, including the robotic uh, VATS approach. Edmund, can, compared... you do can you do a slideshow? We can't see the slide. It's very small. Oh, okay. Um, Just do the play on the top there. Okay. Oh, no. Okay, it's okay, just continue. Because we, it's a little small, I can't see this. Yeah, that's it. Okay, can you see it better now? Yeah, it'll come up in a minute. It's not come up at the moment. Uh, we can't see us now. No. For some reason. Okay. Okay, let, let's go back to the previous view. Just go back and okay. see the slides as, yeah, okay. Yeah. Moving, not moving. Oh, is it is it okay now? Uh, at least I can't see the slide on the slideshow. Mm. It's okay. Leave it here. Leave it here, Edmund. Let's just finish the discussion. So there is an yeah. evolution from posterior lateral thoracotomy to uniportal. Uh, yeah, that's good. Yes. Yeah, we can see. Okay. It. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So again, uh, the development for uh, those doing initially posterior lateral then. Some surgeons opted to stand in front of the patient instead of standing at the back. So they did the axillary or the anterolateral thoracotomy. This is the, you know, um, the eventually went uh, and, and evolved into using video equipment, uh, using an anterior approach VATS. And uh, now, currently, um, those doing anterior approach are those that do multiport VATS, the Fisher less technique, the two probe VATS and unicordal VATS, sub siphoid VATS, these are all modifications of the VATS anterior approach, including the robotic uh, VATS uh, approach. Because compared to those who are standing at the back of the patient, who did the VATS at the posterior, uh, standing at the back of the patient, these are the, you know, the, the techniques uh, advocated by William Walker. And uh, these are the multiport Fisher based uh, technique. And this is also the central approach as um, mon um, 
uh, the, the, the completely portal robotic lobectomy approach by uh, William Serfolio. So you can see there's so many variations uh, in the way we practice VATS right now. So that's why if you, you, you look at YouTube and look at the different ways of, of, of doing VATS, it's kind of, kind of confusing, but you need to understand how it evolved for you to understand. And you have to you know, develop your own technique. Each technique is correct. Each technique has you know, his, its advantages. Uh, and Uniportal is not you know, um, uh, you know, the only technique that, uh, you know, that, that's, that's, uh, it, it really has the no, section between the artery and the, has no clear advantage, uh, over the others. Okay. So the way I, it, like, you know, you do a multi-port VATS, it's like eating with the chopsticks, right? So if you have this kind of view, if, if you do an interior approach with the multi-port VATS compared to a posterior approach, which has its advantages because you see the, the vessels directly in front of you. And um, it's not like, you know, the, the instruments are coming uh, away from you like that in the anterior approach. In unicordal bats, that's why I do it because I feel it's, it's you know, more natural for me. Um, like, you know, eating a chopsticks right, right in front of you. It's just very ergonomic for me. And there's not much really difficulty um, when I, uh, evolved from multi-port anterior approach to a uniport VATS. So, um, but with regards, you know, oncologic outcomes and, you know, uh, post-op outcomes, they're also all, all basically the same. And there's no advantage of one, one technique over the other. Is pain less in uniportal, you think? No, no, <laughs> definitely not. It's, it's, it's all the same. You know, one thing about the different approaches uh, that I, I noted is that for a <coughs> sub approach, it's almost pain-free uh, because you don't go into the, the, the interspace. So um, among the different approaches, I, I think the pain is less for a sub free approach. Okay. Now, just coming back to your discussion on inflammatory diseases and lobectomy, uh, I wanted to ask you about use of uh, muscle pedicle for your uh, bronchial stump to prevent a mm -hmm. neural fistula or a bronchial stump blowout. What percentage of your cases do you do it? And if you do it, what is your indication? How do you decide? And then, mm -hmm. you know, how do you go with it? What is available in the chest for us to use as a muscle flap, to, uh, for us to use as a flap? Yes, yes. Of course, the, the, the standard one, uh, latissimus, is the, you know, the, the most bulk of muscle that you can use to cover it. And you should be harvesting that muscle even before you do, you know, as you open the chest, you try to preserve the latissimus and uh, mobilize it so you can you put it there inside. But we usually do this when we do open thoracotomies. Okay. And in VATS, it's actually very difficult to do that. Because uh, you don't you don't access the latissimus with you know when you do your access incisions, so the most you can probably do is maybe take out uh, an intercostal muscle. But the problem with the intercostal muscle is you don't have the bulk really to uh, use that as a, you know a good coverage uh, for your bronchial stump. But you can harvest several um, intercostal muscles for you to cover it. But uh, me right now, I think it's it's kind of tedious to do that, especially with you know you have reinforced staplers, you have uh, um, sleeves that you actually put to reinforce that that staplers, and you can use the uh, sealants also to further prevent um, some. So I rarely use now um, um, you know viable muscle for me to cover that. Before I was using it, yeah. Sure. In, in my clinical practice, I have definite indications where I will use a muscle flap. The first indication mm -hmm. is when there is presence of active endobronchial tuberculosis. So write this down. You have to talk about this in the exam. So if I have a positive sputum coming on a bronchoscopy, I will err on the side of putting in a flap. My second indication is when the patient has had a previous chemo radiotherapy. If the patient has had previous chemo radiotherapy for whatever reason, it could be a CA breast and then we are operating for TB or it could be a 
adjunct chemo radiotherapy followed by surgery for lung cancer whatever it is if there is a previous exposure to chemo radiotherapy i will put in a muscle flap if the patient has evidence of immunocompromise that means that the patient has had a, a liver transplant or a renal transplant and is on immunocompromised drugs then i will put in a muscle flap and fourth and uh, not the least is if it's a patient with very poor nutrition if i feel that the patient's nutritional status is not good then i want to err on the side of caution because i feel that his healing may not be good and that will give rise to a bronchopleural fistula so these are my four indications for putting in a muscle flap it's better to be to err on the side of caution rather than to not do it because after you get the fistula there's nothing it's a disaster so i i end up doing a little more flaps than i would normally do the things available to me as he rightly said if it's an open thoracotomy then you've got the latissimus but most of the times because we do vats and robotics i will harvest an intercostal muscle flap and i do it after i finish the lobectomy or whatever else i i just go back and i harvest it and swing it down the other options available to me are pericardial fat if you've got a nice long thymic pericardial fat i will harvest it and swing it across to put it on there the third option is to use a pericardium so you make a u shaped pericardium incision like a window but base it on the pericardium don't just take it off completely and swing it and if it can flap over if it's you know sometimes the bronchial stump is technically close to the pericardium and if it is then i swing it over and put it on and the fourth flap that i was used is when i've done a pneumonectomy if i've done a pneumonectomy then i will look at the phrenic and i will see if there is good enough of uh, sort of uh, fat and so i'll take the whole phrenic pedicle down i'll cut off the phrenic because i also want the diaphragm to come up in the post pneumonectomy space and i will swing the phrenic across and stitch it to the uh, to the flap but you don't have to stitch it tightly that's one thing you got to remember it has to be you have to put stitches on two sides far away place the flap and just lightly tie your stitches over you just want to place it you do not want to sort of squeeze it onto your bronchial stump because if you squeeze it too tight it will lose vascularity and you will lose the flap it will just fall off after a little while so just a light stitch to keep it in place so these are the definitive indications for using a intercostal muscle flap you might be asked this in the question uh, in the exam and if you are then feel free to answer it i i loved his uh, bronchoscopy showing the uh, uh, bronchopleural fistula and the blow out of the bronchus now edmund i'm going to ask you what are the treatment options for a patient you've done a lobectomy following mm -hmm. the lobectomy you are now yeah. seeing a either infection in the chest or you're feeling that this guy is starting to get a bronchopleural fistula which means he's lying on the opposite side he gets coughing so these are some yeah. patients telling you so how will you treat this let's just i know you covered it in your talk but just for the exam going people let's talk 1 2 3 4 so what are the strategies for management of these situations yeah so very important is that you do a, a fiber optic bronchoscopy to check uh, your the yeah your stump yeah. and make sure that um, you know you don't have a, an opening in the stump of course uh, once you've seen that and uh, you, you have to confirm it radiologically likewise and uh, normally you'll, you'll have a fluid uh, accumulation in your pleura Uh, because of that spill, and you have to drain that fluid and send it for cultures, and uh, you have to decide if you get it early, um, and you detect it early, you have to go in before uh, uh, the pleural sepsis and then pyema sets in. So you could go for a primary repair, reinforce it, you know, get all the muscle flaps you can get, uh, viable tissue, pericardium to close it. and reinforce that uh, that opening because once uh, pleural sepsis and empyema sets in then you know it's too late for you to if you try to close it, it's going to open up again so if you get it um later and uh, you weren't able to detect it early then you have to have adequate drainage you have to create a, a pleural window and uh, later on 
once you have uh, the sepsis, pleural sepsis controlled, you can go in and uh, repair it, uh, use uh, muscle to, to close it, to patch it. Uh, yeah, so uh, really depends on how uh, early you got uh, the, 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 the complication of uh, bronchial stump. Okay, let, let me just clarify for the students uh, for their exams, just a thought process. So when you've got a patient with a suspected bronchopleural fistula, there are two strategies of management. The first strategy, which is the most important strategy, is control of sepsis, most important. And the second strategy is closure of the bronchopleural fistula. So when you talk about control of sepsis, you have to say, number one, I will start IV antibiotics according to whatever sensitivity I've got. Number two, I'll put in a chest drain to drain out the pus. Number three, if the patient is nutritionally depleted or is hypovolemic, uh, I will top that up either with parental nutrition or with the you know, putting a uh, NG catheter or NG catheter and start feeding the patient with high protein diet because you really need proteins for healing and for control of sepsis. So that's one side of the study. Don't jump into saying I will suture the bronchus and all that. No, the first one is the patient. So let us control the sepsis of the patient. And then the second one is control the bronchus. If it is very early following the surgery and it is a major leak, I will re-explore, go back in, re-explore and close the bronchus and put up whatever is needed. So either an intercostal muscle, but here I want really thick stuff. So if possible, I might do it by open thoracotomy. I'll get the lettuce machine, or I might even harvest the omentum from the abdomen and swing it into the chest via a subcostal space and place it on the bronchus. Or again, we can use any of the others, intercostal muscle flap and the other stuff. That's if you've got it early. If it has come late, say two or three weeks later, and on bronchoscopy, you found a very tiny little hole, then I will try an endobronchial technique to stop the uh, bronchopleural fistula. The success rate is very poor, but worth a try if it's only a small one. And the things that are available to you are tissue glue, uh, like Tisil. Uh, some people have also used cyanoacrylate glue. Some people have used a small blocker into that area. And number four is putting in an endobronchial valve into that thing. So the endobronchial valve prevents the air from going into that area and allows the distal bronchus to uh, you know, not uh, regurgitate and to heal up. So these are all the various things. And then, of course, last but not the least is open surgical technique that you need. So first endobronchial therapy, if possible. And then that, if that is not possible, then open surgical technique, which we've just described. So in the exam, get it organized in your mind. It, you shouldn't just randomly say things. You should first on one side is control of sepsis, most important. You can do what you like to that fistula. If the patient is septic, he's going to die. So control of sepsis, then on the other side is to treat the fistula primarily. Is, is that okay, Edmund? Anything else you want to add? Yes, to? True, true. Yeah, completely agree, completely agree. Okay. Now, have, have, what about a lung abscess, Edmund? What are treatments for lung abscesses? Yeah, um, well, lung abscesses primarily, um, unless these are giant lung abscesses, uh, are treated uh, mostly medical management with IV antibiotics, and you don't go in right away and uh, do surgery for these cases. Yeah. Unless you have a failure of lung management, about four to six weeks, of uh, IV um, antibiotics, but you have to do a uh, bronchoscopy uh, in these cases. So you have to rule out an endobronchial obstruction that, that, that uh, might uh, you know, make your medical management um, fail. Yep. And uh, maybe the only indication uh, for those are you know, large, large abscesses that uh, you know, cannot be controlled with, with IV antibiotics. Then, you, you can you can go in, especially for those with uh, endobronchial obstructions. But otherwise, uh, there's a fairly good chance that these patients will be managed uh, successfully with with uh, with uh, IV antibiotics, as long as they are uh, culture directed. 
So others would, would opt to do instead, uh, especially for these patients presenting with sepsis, uh, to do a, others would do a percutaneous drainage for that, although there's a risk for like a leakage of that, um, um, of that uh, content of that abscess to the pleura resulting in empyema. But uh, specifically for areas that, uh, in, in, in uh, parts of the lung that is uh, adherent to the, to, to the chest wall, then you know, it's quite safe to do a percutaneous drainage, but those that are deep-seated lung abscesses, um, it's not really safe for you to do percutaneous drainage for those cases. So if you have a safe window, based on, on CT scan, uh, then it's an option. It would be also good for you to do a percutaneous drainage. Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely correct. Uh, surgical management is not the first option. The first option is always medical management. In my personal practice, because I work with people uh, who are transplant surgeons, and very often the transplant patients who are immunocompromised, they are the ones who get bad lung abscesses they are not the ones who will respond to medical management because their immunity is very compromised. So in my situation, I'm forced to offer surgical treatment. In fact, the nephrologists want a surgical treatment, which means you take it away and then we will treat with antibiotics. And in those scenarios, you do operate. The options are either a wedge resection, if it's a small peripheral abscess, or if it's an atypical lesion. Also, they want you to operate because they want to grow the bug because they really want to know. They get all sorts of weird bugs uh, post uh, immunocompromised patients. So they want to know what is the bug and they want to treat it accordingly. So I would either do a wedge resection or I would do a lobectomy. In fact, if it's a large abscess, I don't mess around putting staples on the lung. I actually want to do a lobectomy. I take the whole thing out. Safer to put a staple line on a healthy bronchus than to put a staple line on an unhealthy lung. So these are some things that you have to remember. So in a normal scenario, always medical treatment, but in certain conditions and certain indications, surgery is preferred over medical treatment, particularly in an immunocompromised post-transplant patient. Okay, I'm going to throw the floor open for all the students to ask questions. Uh, please, uh, as, as you know, uh, switch on your microphone, identify yourself, and then please ask the question. Who wants to ask the first question? Yeah, Shashikaran, go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, Dr. Shashikaran from AIMS, sir. Uh, so, hello. Uh, hello. Uh, it was a, a very good, extensive presentation. Where, uh, sir, you. Uh, uh, when uh, once you uh, close the uh, bronchus with a staple with a triple stapler, uh, triple lined stapler, do you need to uh, yeah. uh, buttress it with uh, sutures over that, or uh, and if you're not using a uh, a flap or something, then you need to do you need to buttress it or not? Um, I, I usually don't add additional sutures, uh, do manual suturing of uh, a sustainable line of resection. I would reinforce it though, either with a viable tissue, like, like we have discussed, like uh, a muscle. Um, again, if you're doing it through vats, so Again, you could use the interfossal muscle or the, or the pericardium for that or any fat around it. Uh, but I, I never suture it um, the way like maybe uh, um, the way bariatric surgeons do it. Like when they staple, they add sutures. But in a bronchus, it's actually not really necessary. You just have to reinforce it. And if you have those you know, more uh, advanced staplers with reinforced uh, um, staples, uh, uh, materials like you know having a, a seam guard for example then it can further um, you know minimize the chance of you having some blowout others would put <laughs> sealants into it uh, to minimize um, uh, having a, a fistula do you, do you Dr. Khan uh, yeah, I, I, I actually quite enjoyed this question Sashikar and I like the question that you asked I know exactly where you're coming from there are some surgeons particularly in the open thoracotomy world who actually mm -hmm. will use a stapler and then will suture on top of it to, to uh, make them sleep well at night. Probably that's what I, I think my answer to this is, if you are going to use an equipment, you have to trust the equipment. If you don't trust the equipment, it's better to not use it at all and just cut open and suture with your hand. 
90% of the times the surgeon who's suturing over a stapling line is doing it for his satisfaction, not for the benefit of the patient. There is absolutely no evidence which suggests that putting sutures over a stapling line reduces the incidence of bronchopleural fistula. In, if anything, you will cause more complications than benefit to the patient. So that's the first answer. Yes, there is a need for using buttressing of stapling lines only in a specific situation. The one place where I do buttress my stapling line is when I'm doing lung volume reduction surgery in a patient with very bad lung tissue. If I'm worried that my stapling line is not going to hold and the, 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 there is not enough tissue on which I am stapling. So you see the principle of stapling on a lung is that the staple must lie on healthy tissue. That is the first principle. And if you're not able to get a staple on a healthy tissue, there is very high chance that your staple will give way and you'll have prolonged air leak in the post-operative period. That is the only indication where I will buttress my, my sutures. Now, there were two types of buttressings that are available. One was which was prefixed onto the staple itself. This was a Covidian TRS stapler, which was available till about five or six years ago, I think. And they had serious complications with the buttressing of the suture. It was a huge medical legal problem. A lot of patients had complications with the buttress used on the suture line, and that has been completely pulled out of the market. So that stapler is no longer available, which is a pre-buttress suture. And the other option that is available to you <clears throat> is an allied company which produces a pericardial buttress on which you're supposed to put glue or a cyanoacrylate glue and then stick it to the, to the staple and then staple it. Uh, I, I've just acutely forgotten the name. It's produced by Synthes. Synthes Dupont, which has now been taken over by Ethicon. So Synthes used to produce these uh, cartridges which had a pre pericardium laid over on it. And you had to actually, it came with a cyanoacrylate glue and you applied the cyanoacrylate glue on the cartridge and outside, before firing it, you, you closed the stapling line on it. So what caused is that the pericardial uh, patch got stuck to the, to the stapler and then you put it in and fire the stapler. So these are the two options that are available to you. But in answer to your question, there is no evidence to buttress your suture line on a bronchus. If you don't trust it, better just cut the bronchus across, even by VADs, and suture it. If you are capable of suturing a bronchotomy, then suture it. Otherwise, you have to trust your equipment. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, true. I, I, I see it. specific because yeah, you guys it are into exams and I, I can't afford to <laughs> mess around with it. Okay, who's next? Uh, who wants to ask? Sir, uh, I have right. two more questions. Karan has got one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, Eddie, go are you okay with time? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, it, I'm free. Go ahead. To help these guys with their questions. So thank you for that. So when you're operating for uh, aspergillomas, uh, do you uh, give a prophylactic uh, antifungal for these patients, or uh, uh, one will make sure that there is no spillage into the uh, other lobe or the opposite uh, lung by using endobronch uh, blockers or uh, uh, proper positioning and uh, placing a double lumen tube and uh, uh, whether you uh, give these patients any, uh, if there is any spillage intraoperatively, do you recommend using antifungals in the postoperative period or not? Okay, I'll let Edmund take the first go and then I'll follow him with my practice. Yes, yes. Sure. Okay. Um, normally, if you have only an aspergilloma, not an invasive um, aspergilloma, well, um, based on evidence, they, they, there's no definite consensus. Others would give antifungal, others would, won't. But basically for just an fungus ball aspergilloma, which is localized, is basically surgical. And we don't give antifungal even post-op for these patients. Uh, uh, unless you have a documented aspergillosis, which is invasive, then you give antifungal for, for, for these cases. Uh, for spillage, we try as much as possible to prevent spillage in the pleura from happening. Um, if, if, if ever that happens, 
Um, again, there's no consensus. Others would give antifungal, others would just do. Uh, but um, because, you know, these cases are frequently seen in Western countries, there is actually no data on this. It really depends on different countries and how they manage it. But us in the Philippines, we don't um, usually give antifungal um, in, in most of the cases that we encounter, except for invasive aspergillosis. Yeah. Okay. I, I'll share my experience with you guys. I, I, I want to see the worst thing to happen to you in the post-op period is when your patient does well for the first two, three, four, five days, and then come the fifth day, he starts to gradually sink down. And then, you know, over a period of few more days, you find that there are infiltrates in the other lung. This is the worst scenario. And this is because intraoperatively, there has been some spillage or there has been a systemic spillage which has caused uh, systemic uh, aspergillosis for this patient. I am, I, because I have lost patients due to these problems, I am actually completely radical. I'm on the other side. Here, henceforth, I don't want any patient to get uh, any fungal problems. All my patients will not reach the operating table till they have had at least two weeks, minimum of six weeks of antifungal preoperative. So if I see them in the clinic, I'll send them back to the pulmonologist and they will routinely start them with antifungals. Uh, the common one in our practice is itraconazole and anything else, whatever the pulmonologist wants to start. On table, my prophylaxis for uh, spillage starts from the time of the anesthesia. So my preoperative prophylaxis is in place. On, at the time of the anesthesia, uh, I, I'll, I'll just tell you that we had one case, a 10-year-old boy who had a lower lobe aspergilloma. And when he was awake, he had a cough reflex. And because he had a cough reflex, he was not showing any signs of spillage, endobronchial spillage. Uh, usually, they will have some endobronchial communication. The moment we put this kid under anesthesia, the moment they just induced him, he lost the cough reflex. The moment he lost the cough reflex, the whole of the fungus got spilled into that lung and onto the opposite lung, and the anesthetist could not even ventilate him. So we were really in a crash situation. And uh, obviously, post-operatively, he got systemic fungal septicemia, et cetera, et cetera, long ICU stay. So since then, we have devised, and we have actually published uh, these techniques. All our patients for aspergilloma will have a double lumen tube in the lateral position with the affected aspergillum, affected side down. So my anesthetist will routinely, and we do this because we do a hell of a lot of aspergilloma. A lot of my surgery is aspergilloma. So we, you know, with, with complications, you learn. So all patients will have a double lumen intubation with the patient lateral and the affected side down. That's one. So if it is a right upper lobe aspergilloma, the tube will be placed into the left side. Then we turn the patient back on his back. We perform a fiber optic bronchoscopy through the tube and we place a Fogarty's catheter in the right middle uh, bronchus intermedius, which means you have protected the middle and the lower lobe and you've also protected the other side. At the time of the surgery, when you're doing the surgery, I, I saw Edmund's uh, video and there's a one big difference between Edmund's technique and my technique. I will make my ports, even if it's robotic or it's VATS, I will make my port, my first port, and then I will dissect only enough to reach my second port and my third port. I will not touch any of the adhesions that are there on the chest wall because I don't want to manipulate the lung. I don't want to move the lung from right to left or top to bottom. I don't want to touch the lung at all. That prevents any endobronchial spillage and prevents any systemic blood spillage of the, of the aspergilloma. I actually directly try to identify the fissure or I will move it to one side and I will operate on the hilum. 
from the right and from the left. And I will get my, my key aim during surgery is to staple the bronchus as soon as I can. So I, it might mean that I have to sometimes take the vein to get to the bronchus, or sometimes I, have to, I can get to the bronchus from the back and I get the bronchus. In a right upper lobe, you can get to the bronchus straight away. I will first close off the bronchus. Important to remember that when you're stapling the bronchus, you must remember to tell the anesthetist to pull back the, the Fogarty catheter. Otherwise, you will end up stapling the Fogarty catheter onto the bronchus. So my first move in this surgery is not to get to the adhesions. I don't want to manipulate the aspergilloma. I get into the fissure or the hilum and I get the vessel and the bronchus. I will then finish the rest of the lobectomy, which means I'll get the arteries as they come. Once I know that the specimen is completely isolated from the body, uh, or at least from the main respiratory system, that is when I start tackling the adhesions on the chest wall. Again, the reason, uh, another reason for doing this is because a lot of aspergilloma develops neovascularization which means there are new blood vessels and which are quite big. He showed you that case where he had huge big collateral coming into the chest. And if you puncture it while doing the dissection, that's the end of your VADs because it really obscures the view and it becomes very difficult to continue. So I don't want blood dripping onto the operative field. So I will, every single adhesion, I will do it under vision. I use a lot of diathermy. Sometimes I use a harmonic. The reason I use a harmonic is it gives you, you can catch the vessel. When you're doing a diathermy, you are likely to injure the vessel, that new, that new vessel that's coming, you're likely to cut it across and then it will bleed. So the harmonic gives you the ability to catch the vessel as you're going along. Also, one important point that he made was do not go extra plural. If you go extra plural, you are more at a risk of damaging the thoracic outlet. A structure at the sort of which could be subclavian vein, which could be subclavian artery, could be a, you don't know what the hell is on the other side. That is the reason why I use robotics in aspergilloma. I have a huge experience with this because the robotic arm on an aspergilloma allows you to pull the lung down and the wrist goes over the thoracic outlet. VAX does not allow you to bend over. So the ability of the endo wrist to bend over the lung at the thoracic outlet is hugely beneficial uh, when you're doing this aspergilloma surgery. And then post-operatively, my patient will always get antifungal for three months. There is no scientific evidence for this. This has come purely from having four or five complications where the patient either landed up in the ICU or even died. So we do not take any chance with this. Because the moment you get systemic fungal sepsis, in an operated patient, you are completely on the back foot and this patient will sink down really fast. So better to start it before than to, you know, start it when you are in trouble. So does that answer your question, Sashikara? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, Edmund, are you okay with this explanation, this yeah. thought process? Yes, yes, yes. Others would even do like a CT scan guided installation of that antifungal uh, through yeah. that cavity yeah. itself. You do that. Right? Yeah. Okay, but I, I try not to touch the cavity. So that's why I don't do all of this. But if you've had a spillage, then you're in trouble. So you really got to work hard. Exactly. The moment I have a spillage, I will wash the whole cavity with saline, betadine, and hydrogen peroxide. I use hydrogen peroxide freely in the thoracic cavity. I've done it for over 1,500 cases, and I've had only two uh, cases where I had a severe allergic reaction. I've had no pneumonitis or ARDS. Uh, of course, if the patient has had CABG or has had the pericardium opened or if I have opened the pericardium for some, mm -hmm. I will not, not use hydrogen peroxide because I don't want to irritate the heart. But if it's a nice yeah. close chest, I will happily use betadine and hydrogen peroxide and really suck it out and wash mm -hmm. it. But it's, it is a concern. And uh, at that stage, if mm -hmm. I've spilled it, I'll tell the anesthetist, please give one more shot of antifungal. Again, there is no randomized control trial which support these things. You just do it for the patient. Okay, sure. okay. Next question. Who wants to take the next question? If you have time, I'd like to ask one question. Who is that? George. Yeah. Uh, George, uh, going back to the bronchial stump. Wait, George. Let yes. Me... Okay. 
Um, thank you very much for your presentation. But I, I did notice that you you said you'd either use um, uh, a tissue, a viable tissue, or yes. a surgical sealant. How do you choose mm -hmm. between them? Have you got any preference on either of them, or do you trust them equally? Well, um, before um, uh, we were doing uh, a lot of uh, muscle flaps, basically uh, to reinforce it. It, it it's uh, a lot cheaper, of course, if you do that compared to the newer technologies of putting in, uh, you know, sealants uh, using cyanoacrylate, which is quite quite difficult actually to place on vats. Quite easy to put with open thoracotomy. Uh, but now with the development again of um, you, know, you know reinforced uh, staplers and um, you know socks and or seam guards, um, we have we have done less of uh, muscle flaps. But early on in our experience, we adapted the way we were doing it through thoracotomy and putting putting it put, putting a lot of uh, muscle tissue uh, to reinforce that, and we had uh, good outcomes with that. But again, if you apply VATS now, especially with the Uniport approach, it's quite difficult to uh, put in, uh, you know, uh, latissimus uh, to reinforce it. Again, um, uh, the, the, the choice we have right now is mostly uh, intercoastal. But again, it doesn't, in, in, in very thin patients, this doesn't really give a lot of bulk. That's why um, I personally have shifted to, to using uh, reinforced uh, staplers for for these cases, yeah. It's it's also very important that you manage it pre-op. Make sure you have um, you know adequate management of your infection, whether it's uh, you know from the lung abscess or maybe TB, uh, to minimize uh, you know having a uh, uh, stump blowout. Yeah, it's not only managed intraoperatively. Uh, pre-op management is very important to prevent this uh, complication. Uh, did, did I understand George saying, <clears throat> what's the question about sealants? Is that what you were asking or was it about muscle flux? I, I sort of missed that part. George, are you still there? Uh, George has just logged off after your question. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, so let's let somebody else. Uh, just a quick, uh, George, are you still there? Good. I can see you. George, was your okay. question about muscle flux or were you asking about use of sealants? I, I didn't quite understand your question. Sorry, sorry, I was locked up for some reason. Um, I mean, okay. would, you, would you use the sealant or a viable tissue? Or are you choosing between them? Or is there a preference or do you trust each method equally? So, so yeah, Edmund, he's asking whether would you use seal, Would you use a sealant or would you use a muscle flap? What is yeah. your method? And if there is a patient, uh, patient difference that makes you use each one or is you feel it's equally safe? Well, I, I think um, it, it's it's uh, both safe, but uh, for me, you know, using a tissue doesn't add additional cost. Like if a patient, like you know, the healthcare in the Philippines is a, a lot of them is out of pocket, and using you know to seal or sealants is quite expensive. And you know, if a patient can actually afford um, having that, then you know, I'd gladly put that. In. It's it's a lot easier for me. But, um, you know, patients who really cannot afford that. So I'd, I'd prefer harvesting a viable tissue, intercoastal flora, or uh, mediastinal fat to, to cover my uh, stump. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, more of um, yeah practical uh, uh, decision making rather than, you know, uh, a scientific basis for choosing one over the other. But so far... As, as uh, basing on my experience, both are, are, are equally uh, good in reinforcing your, your staple lines. Thank you, thank you very much. Can I, can I say something? George, don't log off, listen to me. <laughs> okay. George, uh, I, I completely agree with Edmund. I, I, the only time I have been using sealants a lot was when I was doing an industry-sponsored randomized controlled trial of this is free <laughs> that time no it wasn't free actually it was still costly. Oh, it wasn't. but uh, that was the time when i was using a lot of these sealants in all these years of practice and you know as you know i do a hell of a lot of intra surgery and aspergillomas surgery i can remember only one patient in which i actually 
uh, and this was not during the trial, this was somebody, this was a 16 year old boy from a very, very rich family who developed an MDR TB and developed an aspergilloma in the left lower lobe and came in with acute hemoptysis. As in really, he was flown in from another city because they knew I was there in the country. And this was the only time I remember operating on a Sunday afternoon, taking him to theater and doing a that's left lower lobectomy. And as with all these high, high profile patients, he got an air leak post op In fact, immediate post op everything looked fine. The lung was expanded and we pulled the drain out and then he got an air leak and he got a pneumothorax. We put in a chest drain again. And then the air leak would not settle for at least 26 days. And then the father said, you know what? I have full faith in you. You do whatever you want to, but go back in and see if you can stop it. And I went in and on the bronchial stapling line, just at the edge, when I put in the water, that uh, there was a tiny leak from the edge of that stapling line. Now, I could have very easily put a stitch on it, but I was concerned that this was a post-operative patient and I was worried about infection in that area. I was worried that my stitch would not hold. So I actually used a seal at the end. We got a special long applicator and we put it on that seal and we put a, covered it with some surgery cell and I tested again underwater and there was no leak and I prayed like hell and came out. And actually that's the <laughs> only time I remember when Tissil stopped a leak. Honestly, I don't think these stapling things, uh, these glues and things really work once it's a bronchial leak. They don't work. They just blow out. If you do it endobronchially, the patient coughs it out uh, or, or yeah. just buys you a little bit time. That's all it does. But in this young boy, it seemed to have worked. But that was the only instance I can remember. So I don't know. I would not use uh, sealants and all that at this stage. Uh, I would primarily use tissue, as Edmund said. But there is a phase where I use uh, almost every alternate patient I was using sealants versus uh, anything, something else. Uh, and obviously, I was not getting any air leak because there was no air leak supposed to happen in the first place because my staple was around. But because it was a sponsored study, we did it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next question. Anybody else? So I have one question. Uh, I just wanted to know with, what is your experience with the uh, bidaculine, which causes QTC prolongation. So because you're operating four months and bidaculine generally goes on for six months. So what is your experience with that? Is that for, uh, what is bidaculine? First tell me that. I have no Sir, idea. Uh, it is uh, one of the newer drugs for MDR TB. I don't have any experience with that. You're the best. Uh, you're the boss in MDR TB. She works in the National TB uh center uh so she she knows all about the new drugs i have no experience with it sorry uh edmund have you got any experience with this wonder drug uh no no it's it's uh my my i work as a team with my pulmonologist with this an infectious specialist with this um uh, yeah i i i, I have no experience yeah, with that probably my my practice is also very specialist based as in i do not interfere with the, <laughs> any uh, medication or pharmacy. In fact, oxycillin, I would probably not know any antibiotic. Uh, so the trouble was we were wondering whether uh, intraoperatively there are certain precautions that are to be taken. Um, because not. generally we don't operate while the patients are on bidaculin. That is why I asked the question. That's please, all. Please, please tell us about it for the benefit of us and other yes. well. <coughs> word and share. Yes. So bidaculin is one of the newer drugs uh, uh, that is supposed to be very effective for uh, anti-MDR-TB patients yeah. and it has been released under conditional access, especially at least in India it is available mm -hmm. and uh, it causes QTC prolongation uh, in patients uh, who are taking the drug which can, if that goes more than five times the normal, they are supposed to stop the drug. So my uh, question in my mind was that since we are operating at four months of MDR-TB regimen, uh, so, and bidaculin is given for six months at least. So, will that have any effect on the perioperative period? Let me, let me, let me just interrupt here. In case of MDR-TB, I will not operate till a year down the road. I, I usually want the MDR treatment to be way into its own thing. The four to six weeks or uh, the three months that he's talking about is for other diseases like aspergilloma or for TB or things. The moment I have a patient of MDR-TB, 
I will push back surgery almost up to a year before I touch it. Because I, the only reason for me to operate in an MDR TB is if there's an acute problem like a hemoptysis, that's besides the point. But there is some evidence to show that if there is a residual patch on the lung, then it harbors the MDR drug and surgically debulking the lung or taking away that patch then makes the medication more effective. And I will not operate at least for a year. I do not operate. I've got at least four people I know in my follow-up who are on MDR TB medications and they are begging me for surgery and I'm trying to put them off saying, I will not touch you till at least a year of the treatment. Well, um, the, the, the slide I showed is actually for uh, uh, MDRTB uh, that uh, you do four months of treatment. The reason behind that is because they noted in their studies that if you you get you intervene uh, with surgery after the uh, medical treatment has failed, there is a high incidence of uh, there is a high pneumonectomy rate uh, for these patients. So what they do. Uh, in, 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 in here in the lung center of the Philippines, if we have an MDRTB, which is localized to one lobe, and then we, we have this uh, multidisciplinary team that uh, sees this patient and uh, assesses for uh, if these are candidates for surgery. So after four months of second line anti-TB treatment, they undergo surgery. And then after they continue, so you don't, you don't actually stop your, your question with regards to second line anti tb treatment, the newer one, you continue it after, even after uh, surgery for a uh, minimum of about 12 months after. Uh, so it, it shortens the duration of the treatment compared to the 24 months of uh, uh, continuous uh, second line anti tb uh, regimen or uh -huh. multi tb yeah. I, I personally have managed to convince all my pulmonologists, so I will not operate. Yeah. <laughs> so, sir, I had one more question. Uh, when are we operating on endobronchial tuberculosis? Because that was, uh, to me, considered to be a relative uh, contraindication to do surgery. Absolutely right. Endobronchial tuberculosis is a relative contraindication, but the ones that I've operated are the ones which you just mentioned, the MDR-TB lot or the MOT group, who actually continue to shed uh, bacilli in the future and again they have had six months to a, a year of treatment before I get involved so you're right endobronchial TB is, is a real problem and I want not to operate but the physicians will push your arm saying you know until and unless you take away this source I am not going to get sputum negativity so particularly in MOT and in MDR TB when they have had more than adequate and the Pulmonologist has twisted my arm so much that it's hurting now. That is when I'll operate. But preferably okay. endobronchial TB, you don't operate. But, uh, you know, sometimes you're pushed to it. So in all these years, you know, it's not a big number of endobronchial TB that I would have done. Maybe, you know, 10 or 12 probably. Where, again, the physician pushed me saying, I am not able to get sputum negativity. So please take this out. And this is after multidisciplinary meetings and, uh, you know, the tumor boards and all that. So not tumor board, but multidisciplinary meetings. Yeah. Thank you, sir. All right. See, you know more about sir. than we do. So we, are, we bow to your superior knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir, I'm just a student. No, no, honestly, you guys genuinely know, because if I have a patient with MDR TB, I actually want to send him to your center because I don't think a regular pulmonologist can manage it as well as your guys. So that's why I always actually send them to LRS. But sometimes, uh, you know, the private patients don't want to go to LRS because obviously in a government setup, they don't feel comfortable. Okay, next question, anybody else? Sir, uh, sir, I'm all, sir. I'm all here, sir. Uh, sir, what is the time frame for uh, operative management of early uh, bronchopleural fistula? Uh, is there any definite time uh, before which we go ahead with operative tech? operative treatment Edmund. oh if, if you catch it early uh, the earlier the better if you if you, you should really have a high index of suspicion that these patients have a, a bronchopleural fistula uh, or a, a stump out so better if you enter early if you're asking about alveolar leaks um, most of these uh, cases uh, resolve uh, spontaneously 
So you have to know whether your ear leaks are, are coming from, you know, alveolar leaks or these are actual bronchopleural fistulas from the, you know, open uh, uh, stump of the bronchus. That's why bronchoscopy is important if you're considering a stump blowout versus an alveolar leak. And there are certain uh, characteristics you would check whether these are actually alveolar leaks from the periphery or, or, or central leaks. If you have, if you have like a, a you know massive uh, continuous air leaks, uh, better if you have those uh, you know digital drainage devices, uh, the medulla that you you can actually measure uh, digitally the 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 the, the volume uh, of of air coming out, and you you can likewise predict uh, better predict. Uh, how long before this uh, air leaks close, and that will help guide you whether you have to intervene early, or you can just be conservative and just wait for it to resolve spontaneously. Yeah. So otherwise, if you don't have the digital drainage systems, then you can you can do clinical and you know see whether your lungs are expanded, whether the the you know the characteristic of the air leaks as the as uh, the days goes by. Yeah. Dr. Khan. Yeah, well, the surgical intervention has a bimodal peak. Okay, if you look at the graph of surgical interventions, there is a bimodal peak. As Edmund said, the first is in the first week. As soon as you've operated, you know you've got a bronchopleural fistula when the medulla cannot handle the five liters. Forget, forget two, three liters, it just goes beyond the five liters and you are getting a beeping continuously. So surgical failure is, is almost instantaneously. So that's the first peak where within a day or two, or in fact, even the same night, you might go back in to actually redo your bronchial anastomosis. The problem is the onset of infection. So once you've passed the first peak, then when the fistula happens, then you've got a patient who's got an empyema and systemic sepsis. That's the problem. So there you have to actually control the, uh, sep uh, the infection and hope that it heals. So the second peak comes, you know, third to fourth week later, when you have given him adequately a week or 10 days of antibiotics, you put in a chest drain, you're repeating the bronchoscopy, you're giving IV antibiotics. And then if it is still not stopping, then you think of doing something. So the answer in the exam is, it has got a bimodal peak. One is immediately after surgery within the first few days. And then because of the onset of sepsis, you have to control the sepsis. That is the first philosophy of management. And then the surgical repair will come a few weeks later. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. sir can, matlab, we can mention, uh, mention uh, first week as uh, the time frame for operative yeah, intervention. Well, sometimes yes, sir. Night. You know, I, I have actually gone back the same night. As soon as yes, I sir. came out and, uh, you know, the medulla was just not able to handle. It was beeping bang, 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 bang. And I, I didn't have a cause of suspecting an alveolar leak. As in, you know, I have not dissected the lung much. There is no raw surface. Then I know that it is a bronchial. So I've taken him back to theater, put in a bronchoscope, had a look, and then just turned him over, redone, uh, gone in again, and redone the stapling. And in this situation, the staples hold. So it's not a problem. You can just lift it up and put another set of stapling line below your thing and and they usually hold the problem is when infection sets in then a redo state thing doesn't hold it just cuts yes. to make the matter worse <coughs> so you have to put in muscle flaps vascularized muscle flaps omentum whatever yes sir and and sir uh, for the second uh, peak of surgical intervention are there any uh, things which we are looking at, um, uh, specifically to go in as, as in the size of the bronchus and things like that. Is that what you're asking? The size of the... Uh, uh, sir, generally also, like uh, um, set, uh, settling of the in infection, nutritional buildup of the patient, and what all what other, other things? This has to be done. The one thing you should not do is try and suture that fistula. That is an error. In the second mode, once you're into that two, three weeks down the road, the worst thing you could do is put in a suture on the fistula. Most of the people think, ah, it's a small little fistula. Let me put a suture. If you want to put a suture, then please put a patch on it, whatever you do. Personally, I don't close yes. it. I actually put in a muscle flap on it, a really well vascularized. And I have used Omentum quite a lot. I'm quite happy with Omentum. Mm -hmm. It's the best vascularized pedicle. Yeah, so sure. my plastic yes. will harvest it with, uh, you know, either laparoscopy or little uh, laparotomy, midline laparotomy, and swing it to me into the chest. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Next question, guys. Uh, yes, Edmund, are you okay yeah. with this, isn't it? You don't mind? Yeah, yeah, sure. Fantastic. It's a really good discussion. I'm really enjoying this discussion. Yeah, yeah. These are very bright boys and girls. They're asking some very good questions. Go on, uh, sir. Uh, sir, how do you manage, once you do a lobectomy for an inflammatory lung disease, lobectomy or a bed resection, uh, once you're done, mm -hmm. the remnant uh, lung so many times doesn't expand on table completely. So do you routinely uh, do a uh, uh, clamping of the phrenix to, so that, uh, or you um, uh, uh, divide the phrenix so that the uh, diaphragm moves up or something, or is there any other thing, or we fill up, fill up the remaining space with muzzle flap or something? Well, I, I, I never actually uh, do phrenic nerve crush or much more uh, transecting it. Uh, especially for patients with, with, with uh, competent COPD, that's going to be bad. If you're, you have a, 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 you know, dysfunctional or a, a paralyzed diaphragm, it will affect the, uh, the post-op uh, breathing of this patient. And it would, that would not be good. Probably for maybe, you know, after a pneumonectomy, as mentioned by Dr. Khan, but not for a, for a lobectomy or a, post, uh, a, a problem of a persistent space. One option you can do it, if you like the apex. Uh, others would do a, a apical pleural tenting. They would, you know, do uh, extra pleural dissection if you don't have much adhesions to the apex and bring down the uh, pleura. So that will try to the space. Um, but um, other than that, most uh, after mobilizing, you know, releasing the inferior pulmonary ligament, you can do an extended release by opening up even the pericardium so that everything really goes up. Uh, but normally in time, uh, this uh, space eventually fills up. So some of the patients, they go home with a, you know, with a chest tube uh, with, a, with a portable drain. And uh, they come back, um, you know, a few weeks after the lungs are fully expanded and eventually remove the, the tube. But it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a common problem, especially for uh, complex aspergillomas involving the, um, the upper lobe, this, this space uh, problem. Do, do you, Dr. Khan, do a uh, 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 free crush? Okay. Uh, first thing first, Shashikaran, the one thing I don't want you to mention in the exam is cutting the phrenic. Okay, cutting the mm -hmm. phrenic is not done, it's frowned upon. Okay, so just, just forget that. That is only in a very handful of cases where uh, I've done a pneumonectomy. Okay, in a patient with very good lung on the other side. And it's not even been published as yet. So you, you will not be able to justify cutting the phrenic. Okay, so that's one. Number two, I do use apical tenting as a technique for bringing the... Uh, pleura down to the uh, upper lobe, particularly when I'm worried that the lung will not expand. The second step is I will inject the phrenic with Marcaine, and Marcaine gives me about eight to 10 hours of post-operative uh, uh, paralysis, which allows the lung, diaphragm to go up and the lung to go up. And the third thing I will do is crush the phrenic, as in I will lightly crush. I want to cause neuropraxia, not neurolysis. So I'm very careful about that. I, I don't want discontinuity of the phrenic. I just want temporary neuropraxia for two, three, four days. That's all I want till the lung is stuck to the chest wall. So in my TB practice, I do that quite regularly and I'm pretty comfortable with it. But obviously if I'm worried that paralysis of the diaphragm is going to compromise the patient, I will not do it. Uh, so I, I personally do crush the phrenic, but very gently so that I'm not, dist I know that the phrenic will heal in a few, few days. So that's my uh, strategy. So far, I haven't had to go back and plicate the diaphragm, to be really honest. Uh, I, I don't mm -hmm. have a single case where I've actually, because I do a lot of thymoma surgeries where you do take away the phrenic itself. And uh, I have not plicated the diaphragm in any of these uh, cases and they have been okay post-op but that's because they had good residual lung function but obviously they cannot run the marathon uh, you know that's the bottom line they will have no no eventration um, in um, future eventrations no problems with that yeah if, uh, if they get eventration in future you can solve it but at that stage 
the importance is to get a clearance of margin of the thymoma. So that, that is a compromise one versus a two. But in TB surgery, I inject, um, uh, uh, I inject, what was the drug I just said, uh, whatever it is, uh, Marcane, which is a long acting local anesthetic. And mm -hmm. that causes enough irritation of the phrenic. Uh, in all these years, I have had only one patient who had, uh, no, one patient who had problems with the space, as in an empty space at the apex and got infected. I've had a few patients who've got an empty space, they go back home, and three to six months later, the lung gradually expands and fills up the space. Uh, one or two people out there who have got in a space and just carrying on with life. Uh, no, no problem. Yeah. So you just accept that. As, a as long as there's no um, air leak actually coming out. As long as there's no air leak, it doesn't really matter. A little bit of space. You just have to be careful that it doesn't get infected. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? If not, I'm going to call a day for this one. This was really a beautiful, beautiful and exhaustive lecture. I know we all see a lot of tuberculosis and we think, yeah, we know it all. But every time you speak to an expert, there's so many new points that come out and new things that you learn. And I'm really grateful to you, Edmund, for taking time out and uh, you know, educating us on these various techniques. And I will, re uh, since this is all recorded, I will put up the recording uh, maybe tomorrow on the YouTube channel. I'll send you a link for that. And uh, Edmund, please feel free to invite all your uh, trainees uh, from Philippines in future. Yes, yes. More than that, no, no, no. we have capacity to accommodate 100 at this moment. And moment we go over 100, I can actually upgrade the package to 500. So it's, it's possible, just feel free. Only thing is the timing we have to adjust so that everybody's comfortable. Yeah. It's a very good platform. But thank you very much for your time. And on behalf of all the students, I, I really appreciate what you're doing for them. Okay, good day.